Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of On Attachment. In today's episode, we are talking all about phones and the role that phones play in our relationships, in shaping our experience of being in relationship, our relationship satisfaction, our sense of intimacy and connection with our partners. Now, obviously, this is a really big topic and it's one that probably doesn't get spoken about enough given the absolute centrality of phones to our modern lives. As I was preparing for this episode, and reflecting that probably even 10 years ago, it wasn't anywhere near what it is now in terms of the level of dependence that we all experience on our phones, on our devices, how ubiquitous these things are that we are absolutely tethered to. It's rare that your phone is more than a meter or two away. And if you've ever done the scary but illuminating thing of looking in your screen time data at the number of times you pick up your phone in an hour or in a day. I mean, it's pretty scary stuff. And I think that given phones are, you know, they've not only changed the way that we communicate and therefore have an impact on our relationships, because obviously communication is a big part of that. But I actually think because they've changed so much, just the way that we spend our time on a moment to moment basis in intimate relationship, because so much of that time is together. And, you know, that's how we connect with our partner. It's really detracted, I think, from the quality of our presence and connection in many cases. And so it's had really far reaching impacts on all of those things to do with how we experience our relationships and our level of satisfaction there. So there's a lot to unpack in today's episode. I asked my Instagram audience a bunch of questions and did a few polls in anticipation of this episode. And so I'm going to be sharing the results of some of those. And I'm also going to be you know, offering some thoughts on ways that you might broach this conversation with a partner. If you've maybe not had success in doing that, or you haven't quite mustered up the courage to bring this up, but it's something that's been really bothering you. Some ways that you might be able to tackle this issue of phones and over usage, compulsive use, unintentional usage in your relationships if you feel like it is having a negative impact and you're harboring some you know, negative feelings around it, which as we'll come to surveying my audience, there are a lot of people who are feeling really, you know, hurt, rejected, angry, alone, discarded, ignored. Those are some of the words that came up a lot. Uh, and obviously that is not what we want to be feeling in our relationship. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Before we dive into that, I am so excited to share a really big announcement. You might have heard me share over the past couple of weeks that something exciting was coming and today is the day. I'm really, really delighted to share that I am launching a brand new membership community called On Attachment Insiders. So if you are a podcast listener and you love tuning in every week or every so often, On Attachment Insiders is a members only community where you can get more of what you get here alongside community connection, live Q&A calls with me, an extensive resource library of all sorts of things ranging from video lessons to to scripts, to Q&A. There's so much there already and doors have only just opened in the last 24 hours. So it's going to be a growing library of resources. And as I said, a growing community of like-minded people who are walking the same path as you, have the same interests as you, who absolutely know what your experience is like and can empathize and offer solidarity and advice. And of course, I will be in there as well to share thoughts, wisdom, feedback, feedback as needed. And perhaps the best part is that it is super affordable. It starts from just 10 US dollars a month. So by far and away my most affordable offering. And so it's really exceptional value. There are two membership tiers, a starter tier and a premium tier. The premium tier is 25 US dollars a month. So depending on you know what type of experience you're looking for, uh, how much live interaction you're looking for, or perhaps you're more looking to do self-study stuff and going through resources in your own time. Only 50 spots will be offered at that founder's rate after which the prices will be increasing slightly. So if you're interested in joining the On Attachment Insiders membership, which has launched today, head to onattachment.com slash insiders. That's onattachment.com slash insiders. All of that is linked in the show notes. I'm really, really excited and look forward to seeing as many of you as possible there. I think it's going to be a really, really beautiful space and I'm so, so excited. Okay, so let's dive into this conversation around phone usage in relationships. So 
I think it's really important to state the obvious at the outset, which is that we are all a little bit addicted to our phones. I think it's really easy to notice our partner's phone usage and fixate on our partner's phone usage, obviously, because it can bring up these feelings of feeling deprioritized or rejected or, you know, ignored. But because we aren't feeling those things when we're on our phone, we are maybe blind to the extent to which we are guilty of the very same thing that we are criticizing our partner for or or resenting our partner for. So I think let's get that out in the open. Our phone usage, you know, as a society, as a world is pretty bad. We all use our phones too much. And that is because that's what they're designed to do, right? The phones themselves, the devices themselves, and all of the apps within them, social media, everything about it is designed to be addictive. And it's highly effective at creating that dependency. It really hijacks our dopamine circuits and keeps us tethered to these devices uh, so much more than we realize. And I think it is compulsive. It's unconscious so much of the time. And so I think that Recognizing that at the outset and going, okay, yes, we're all guilty of this can take a little bit of the heat out of the conversation. And as we'll come to, I think it's a very good thing to lead with in having any sort of conversation with your partner about this, rather than making it a, this is something that you do problem. Because I think unless you are the very, very rare person who isn't dependent on their phone, who really doesn't have an issue with this, it's likely that you're guilty of it too. So with that being said, I wanted to turn to these survey results responses, picking up my phone now, ironically enough, turn to these survey responses that I put out on Instagram. So I asked people, do you feel that your partner is on your phone too much? And 79% of people said yes. And 21% of people said no. The next question that I asked people was how often do you argue about or feel bothered by phone usage in your relationship. And that was 76% of people said either all the time or sometimes. And then 24% of people said hardly ever. So 76% of people are saying that either all the time or sometimes they are feeling bothered by or arguing about phone usage in their relationships. That's pretty significant when you think about it. So I then asked people to finish this sentence for me. I said, when my partner is on their phone around me, I feel dot, dot, dot. And the answers that I got, I'm going to start reading some of these for you. There are a lot of them and they're mostly in the same vein. So we had unimportant, neglected, less important, neglected. Those are all different ones. So you can see there's a lot of overlap. Ignored, disrespected, angry, annoyed, unimportant, lonely, frustrated, unimportant, lonely, rejected, worried about who they're talking to, ignored, unimportant, like they're not listening to me, distracted, ignored, ignored, undervalued, not important, disrespected, not listened to, like I'm not a priority, devalued, unheard, ignored, neglected, deprioritized, invisible, dismissed, like shit, ignored, angry, invisible, suspicious, undervalued, annoyed, alone, not as important, unimportant, annoyed, neglected, unseen, anxious, less worthy, unvalued, unheard, second best, You get the point, right? I can keep going, but there's a lot of answers in the same vein here. So that is a big problem. Let's just be very clear. For 76% of people to be feeling like that a lot of the time, that is a really big problem because all of that, all of those wounds that are coming up, all of those perceptions are arising from something that's very real. And if we don't have the tools to deal with that in a way that we can be constructive and actually have a conversation about it and bring some more intentionality to it, there's going to be a problem. A lot of these issues in our relationships are either going to turn into some sort of festering resentment, bickering, low grade conflict, or something much bigger. One of the responses that I didn't read out was someone saying, I am literally planning to end my relationship over this. So this is big stuff. And it makes sense because when we hear all of those things, those are much of the time, their attachment wounds. It's saying, you know, I don't feel seen. I don't feel cared for. I don't feel prioritized. I don't feel valued. I feel ignored. I feel dismissed. So even though on the surface, it feels trivial, your partner sitting on the couch next to you, scrolling their phone, not a huge deal. That's not like, wow, how could they do that? (laughs) When it compounds over time and creates this overall relational environment and culture of you're not present with me, I don't feel valued, I don't feel like I'm important to you, that's a problem. 
okay? Because that is touching something within you that is much deeper than phone usage. And so it's going to snowball into something much bigger than phone usage. Now, something that I did want to touch on in this conversation, I think it would be remiss of me not to, is the attachment dynamics here. Phone usage in relationship is not by no means something that is exclusive to anxious avoidant kind of dynamics. But as with many things, I think we could say it's probably exacerbated by it. Uh, And that relates to what I was just saying around those kind of wounds that are brought up when our partner is there and is maybe ignoring us, not paying attention to us on their phone. For someone with more anxious attachment patterns who is sensitive to any sort of perceived rejection any sort of distance, feeling deprioritized, feeling unimportant, feeling like they're not valuable to their partner, feeling like they're generally not enough. It's likely that your partner showing signs of disinterest in the form of scrolling their phone. I say disinterest because that's how you're likely to perceive it. That is really going to be received through the lens of your anxious attachment. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not suggesting that It is because of your anxious attachment that you have a problem with that behavior. As I said, this is not an attachment specific kind of dynamic or problem that we're facing with phone usage. I think it is absolutely ubiquitous. Uh, And I think people with more anxious attachment patterns are going to see it through that lens of rejection more often than not. I think someone with more avoidant patterns, on the other hand, who might be on the receiving end of the criticism around the phone usage, who likely has sensitivities around feeling controlled, monitored, like their partner always wants their full attention and they never get a break. They just want time to themselves. They just want to decompress, all of that kind of thing. An avoidant partner is probably more likely to use their phone to escape, to numb out, to try and maybe blow off some steam, so to speak. At the end of the day, they might just want to sit on the couch and zone out for half an hour while scrolling on their phones. And to be told that they can't do that or they shouldn't be doing that or that that's selfish or rejecting or dismissive of them to be doing that, that might make them more defensive of the behavior and you know their right and entitlement to engage in that behavior. Uh, so they might say invalidating things like, oh, just give me a break. Like, can you just leave me alone? I just walked in the door and I just want to chill out for half an hour. And so if you're the partner who's feeling really hurt and dismissed by that behavior, and then you're met with a response that really minimizes the significance of it and is sort of saying, this isn't a big deal, get over it. Uh, I, I think that would be a very common inroad to anxious avoidant type conflict cycles that could really very quickly escalate from there. This sense of you're not paying attention to me and the response being stop trying to control me, give me a break and then so on and so forth from there. So I think that that is very much within the realms of possibility that you might wind up in that kind of thing if you're in an anxious avoidant dynamic. And the reason I say that is just to be mindful of the different angles from which you're approaching the issue, where you're coming from, and reminding yourself that if you are more anxious, that you do have those wounds. And again, that doesn't mean that you need to drop the issue and solve this problem by yourself or just suck it up. Absolutely not what I'm saying. More just to pause and tune in and go, okay, what am I experiencing? What am I telling myself? When have I felt this before? When else in my life have I felt unimportant or deprioritized or rejected or dismissed? And what is this bringing up for me? So that you are going into any conversation that you have around this with full awareness of what the significance is for you and why it stings in the way that it does. So another thing that I wanted to bring into the conversation here is what's called the fundamental attribution error. You might have heard of this term. It's basically this tendency that we all have, which is to, if we make a mistake or we do something, we tend to attribute that to situational or contextual factors. Basically, we come up with an excuse as to why the thing that we did is actually fine. But if our partner did the exact same thing, we say that it's a function of their character. So let's take this out of the abstract and give an example. Something might be, you know, I left my towel on the floor, but the reason I did that is because I was carrying the baby to the other room and I was in a hurry and I was going to come back and get it. It's not because I'm lazy or thought thoughtless or inconsiderate, it's because there was some explanation for it. Whereas if my partner leaves a towel on the floor, it's because he's lazy and thoughtless and inconsiderate, right? Another example might be if you're running late, it's because 
the traffic was really bad and all of these things outside of your control happened. It's not because you're unreliable, but if your friend is running late, then you're very quick to assume that they've done something because it is just who they are and they are flaky and, you know, unreliable, all of those things. So this tendency to find really valid reasoning, excuses, justifications for the things that we do, but not what someone else does. And I have to admit that I'm so guilty of this when it comes to phone usage. I notice myself saying it both in my head and out loud all the time. If I check my phone, it's because I'm just checking an email or I've got to respond to a text or I'm checking my DMs on Instagram because that's work related. So I'm totally fine on phone usage. But if Joel's scrolling his phone, that's just mindless scrolling and he's being really unconscious about it. And I'm very quick to judge that and differentiate it from the thing that I'm doing, which I consider to have you know, some sort of valid intention behind it. Right. So I think it's very important in terms of cultivating self-awareness and being honest about our own phone usage that we're not engaging in too much of this fundamental attribution area, that we're not coming up with all manner of justifications for our own compulsive or unhealthy phone usage while being very judgmental and critical of someone else's. I think another really common example of this, which you know I, again, am guilty of all the time, is if we're both, say, sitting in bed or sitting on the couch on our phones, and then I put my phone down because I finished whatever I was doing, and Joel continues to be on his phone, and I notice within myself, even after 30 seconds, that this tension rises, and it's this sense of like, put your phone away. (laughs) Like I'm just sitting here, even though like 30 seconds before I was doing the exact same thing. It's just, I spontaneously decided to put my phone away and then I'm getting frustrated with him for not immediately doing the same thing. So I think there is some hypocrisy. There is some stuff that we can take ownership of there. And again, the reason that I suggest doing that, it's the same with like kind of being mindful of the anxious avoidant dynamics. It's not so that we then drop the issue altogether. It's so that we can take some of the steam out of the issue, so that we can take some of the personalization out of the issue. Because if we are going into any sort of conversation about something like this with the story of this is a you problem and not a me problem, or you always do this, or you don't care, I've asked you so many times and you're not doing it. We've had conversations about this and you're not following through. I think the more that we can own like we've all got really bad habits around this and the more we can be aware of our own and really clean up our side of the street or at least take ownership of our side of the street, we're probably less likely to be high and mighty in judging our partner and attacking them for it, which is likely to lead to a more constructive conversation and one that's likely to be more solution oriented. With that being said, let's talk about some of the things that you might want to consider in terms of shifting the balance around phone usage in your relationship. So I think that some things that you might want to implement as hard and fast rules or boundaries. And again, the way that I would encourage you to go about this is not like, hey, you need to stop doing this because I don't like it. I think it needs to be a, hey, I've noticed that we have been on our phones a lot and I really hate how that feels or I feel like we're not actually spending much quality time together, even though we're spending a lot of time together, maybe by quantity, we're in each other's presence, but we're not actually there. We're not actually engaging with each other. It feels really mindless and disconnected. uh, And that feels crappy to me. Would you be open to, and then you lead in with whatever you're proposing. And I think having some level of genuine open-mindedness and flexibility around what that looks like is a good idea. So some things that you might want to implement. I think having no phones at mealtimes is a no-brainer. We definitely don't have phones at mealtimes in our relationship. I mean, very rarely we might have a phone on the table and and one of us might pick it up to look something up, but it's definitely not a scrolling situation. I think in the same way that eating at a table is much better than eating at a couch, watching something, phones away and really being conscious and mindful of spending that time to connect with each other, I think is a really, really good idea and feels like an easy one to give because I don't really know of any valid reason why you need to just be scrolling at dinner time or any other meal time that you're sharing together. I think preserving that ritual is a really important one. Some other ones you might want to consider is having some parameters around evenings or first thing in the morning. I know that we all, again, I won't lie. I definitely pick up my phone first thing in the morning. So whether it's 
having some sort of thing in your relationship where you wake up and say hi to each other and have a hug and a kiss or something before you turn to your phone so that you're not just lying in a dark room staring at a screen in front of your face before you've even connected with your partner. Having something like that might be a good idea. Likewise, having some phone free time before you go to sleep. Not only is that much better for your sleep quality, but probably really good for your relationship as well. Uh, So considering some things like that, and I think that the clearer you can get in those boundaries that you draw and that you agree on, the easier it is. I think if you just sort of shoot for something vague, let's try and be on our phones less. That's never going to work because you're going to have different ideas of what that looks like. There's no containment to that. There's no real framework or structure. uh, And so it's going to be a slippery slope. And I think on that point, be somewhat generous as you approach behavior change around this, recognizing that we are more or less addicted to these devices. So again, I, I got a few responses from people saying we've talked about it and they're still doing it. It's so deeply ingrained within us. It is so automatic. The number of times we pick up our phone and check, open an app and then check another app, bounce between email and Instagram and whatever other apps you use to just check. It's like muscle memory. It's an extension of us. And because it is not conscious, most of the time when we're doing that, I'm sure if you checked your screen time stats and it said you've picked your phone up 85 times today, I'm sure you don't remember picking your phone up 85 times times, but you have, right? And so being generous that if your partner doesn't have 100% adherence from the moment you agree on something, probably don't take that personally. Don't take that to mean they're not serious about this. They don't care about what I've shared. They don't care about what I'm saying. Again, I think we need to depersonalize this as much as possible while still advocating for what is important to us in order to feel you know, more connected in our relationships. So there was one other piece from my Instagram polls that I put out that I wanted to share. And this kind of relates to how to talk about it and maybe what to do by way of a solution. The question that I asked was, For those who are bothered by their partner's phone use, is it how much time they spend, when they choose to be on their phone, or the things that they look at or consume? And 40% of people said when they choose to be on their phone. So that was the highest number by quite a margin. So it was like the timing of when your partner is choosing to be on their phone that seemed to bother most people. Second after that at 24% was the amount of time they spend on their phone. 15% said what they look at or consume. And then a further 21% said all of it. (laughs) So there are 21% of people who are bothered by all of those things, but 40% of people were most bothered by when their partner was choosing to be on their phone. So clearly there is some situational component to this. And I actually think that that is helpful because in framing the discussion, you don't have to say, I need you to not be on your phone at all, or I need you to stop using Instagram or whatever. It just allows you to set up the boundaries of when, right? That there are good times and there are not so good times for it. And are you open to being a bit more intentional about it? Again, I think that it's actually, if you can approach the conversation in a constructive, non-blaming way, you'll probably get good reception from your partner because I think that If most people are being honest, most of us want to use our phones less. Most of us want to be more intentional about our device usage, right? I don't think if you said to someone, your screen time's three hours and 50 minutes a day, do you think that's a good use of your time? Not many people are going to say, yeah, I'm really happy with spending hours and hours a day scrolling on Instagram with absolutely nothing to show for it, right? I think we can all recognize that that is a colossal waste of time and energy that's probably making us more depressed and anxious and disconnected and whatever else, right? No one's really standing up in defense of that being a great use of time. And so I think that if we can join in solidarity with our partners around recognizing that and going, yeah, I don't want that either. I don't want it for me and I don't want it for you. I don't want it for us. Let's keep each other accountable. What do you think would be achievable as a starting shift? And open up the conversation that way. Let's put in these parameters. Let's not do phones at mealtimes. Let's not do phones after 8 p.m. Whatever makes sense in the context of you and your life and your relationship. But Try and approach that as a joint endeavor rather than something where you're getting them in trouble for something that they are doing wrong, something that, you know, is their problem that they need to solve so that they can make you happy because that is going to 
bring up a lot of defensiveness and all of those other dynamics around control and anxiety and stuff that we don't really need to touch into because I don't think it needs to be an issue about that. I really do think it's bigger and broader and more universal than that, frankly. So I'm going to leave it there. I feel like there might have to be a follow-up episode to this. I realize I haven't really gone into this whole other aspect of the phone issue in relationships, which is more around the content and social media usage and other things that partners are not comfortable with, not in terms of the fact that your partner's using their phone, but maybe what they're looking at, boundaries around social media usage, the types of accounts they follow. I know that there's lots of stuff there to explore and discuss, uh, and I don't think that we've got time or space for it in today's episode, but it may need to be a follow-up because I get bucket loads of questions from people about navigating that, navigating their discomfort with their partner's online behavior. And so I think there's definitely stuff to look at there. And I I will make a note to do another episode on that and, and do let me know if that's something that you'd be interested in. But otherwise, I hope that today's been helpful in both normalizing this issue of phones in relationships by letting you know that you're far from alone in feeling, if you feel any of those things that I read out earlier, that you're far from alone in feeling them, that this is so ubiquitous. It is so, so common. And I, as hard as it is, because I do think the odds are stacked against us in terms of these devices being designed to produce these very behaviors, this compulsive usage that we all are guilty of. uh, I think with a bit of intentionality and accountability, you can really, you know, bring some boundaries into your relationship that don't have to feel you know, overbearing or strict or like one of you is enforcing it against the other. I think you can really band together and overhaul your device usage for the greater good of your relationship and, and do that together. So I hope that this has given you something to think about and maybe some tips on how to approach that. And Another reminder that if you're interested, please think about joining on Attachment Insiders. As I said, it's super affordable for the first 50 members. So if you want to snag one of those founding member spots, definitely do so. I'm really looking forward to seeing as many of you in there as possible, where we can have all sorts of conversations around stuff like this and so much more. I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you so much for joining me and I will see you again next week. Thanks guys.